My name is Carmen Bolt, the oral historian at William & Mary. It's currently around 2.30 p.m. on November 14, 2017. I'm sitting in the alumni house with Thomas L. Johnson, Jr. Can you start by repeating your name back to me and telling me the date and place of your birth? Good afternoon, Carmen. My name is Thomas L. Johnson, Jr. I was born in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm from Tappahannock, Virginia. Um, did you ask about date of birth as well? Yes. Okay. My <laughs> date of birth is August 14, 1970. Great. And what years did you attend William & Mary? I was a student here in the undergraduate uh, program from 1988 through 1992. Great. And before we jump into your time at William & Mary, can you start by telling me a little bit, you mentioned where you were raised, but can you tell me a little bit more about being raised there and how you were raised? Um, I was um, the oldest of two boys raised in Tappahannock, Virginia, or an area outside of Tappahannock known as Carette. If you saw it on paper, you would call it Carrot. Um, so I never told anyone where I was from because they didn't know it anyway. Um, as I've gotten older and uh, been around Richmond, uh, obviously people know where Tappahannock is because they go there for the events on the river. Right. So, uh, but I grew up uh, in a in a small area. Um, Dad was a brick mason, um, and my mom was a an administrative assistant in Richmond. And um, pretty simple life, um, middle income family. Um, didn't really want for anything. Didn't get everything I wanted, but um, middle income family and. Um, that, that's pretty much my upbringing. Um, country boy and um, like the outdoors. Great. And when did you first start thinking about college? Probably my sophomore year in high school. Um, I really hadn't given any serious thought to college. I, I, I can't say that I didn't think I was going to go, um, but I hadn't given any thought to actually going either. Um, I was fortunate to be surrounded by a great group of peers. All my friends, um, we were very active. We liked to uh, excel at whatever we did. So we made good grades, but it wasn't for the purpose of going to college. Um, it was just because we liked, liked to excel at the time. So I, I guess uh, the short answer to your question is probably my sophomore year. In, in school. Okay. And how did you find yourself at William & Mary in particular? Well, interestingly enough, William & Mary was not uh, in my list of colleges to even apply to. Um, I was UVA bound. I had the shirt. I had the, um, I had everything ready to go to UVA. I had done multiple visits. Um, but my mother worked for an individual, um, his last name was Dozier, he just passed, and I think he was an alumnus of here, I'm not, not sure, um, but I knew him as Mr. Dozier. And uh, he um, told her that I really needed to consider William & Murray. Um, I'm the first generation in my family to go to college, so my parents didn't know much about schools other than what they heard from people that they were around. Um, so, whether I wanted to or not, William & Mary was put in the list of places to apply. Um, it wasn't until I had a, an admissions visit with uh, UVA uh, that my mind was set on coming here. Um, and that was due to a negative experience at UVA. And again, like I said, I had I had the shirt, I was a fan, I was ready to go, uh, you know, fan of Ralph, Ralph Sampson, um, you know, this, these were the people that, they were, that were there when I was looking to go to school there. So what happened was, one Saturday, a friend of my, myself, we went up to UVA, uh, he's uh, Caucasian, white, white, white male, and he went up and his admissions program was 9 or 9.30. Mine was 8 or 8.30. The fact that there were two different admissions programs was not unusual. It didn't bother me. I knew that they had admissions programs um, 
directed at my minority students and I knew that they had admissions programs for majority students. So that didn't really bother me. Um, saw nothing of it. As the day went on though, um, we came to lunch and we ended up eating in, and I don't want to misquote the place, but whatever it was in 86, 87, I think it was Lawrence Joel Coliseum, um, Memorial Coliseum. We had lunch uh, in the basement of the Coliseum, the, the black students that were there for admissions. Uh, and in the basement, the area that we ate was d divided off with curtains so you could look through the curtains if you wanted to and see floor cleaning equipment, et cetera. That's not the worst thing. Um, the worst thing was our menu. Um, we had fried chicken, watermelon, sweet potato pie, um, any stereotypical black food that you could think of was on the menu for us. Um, my parents were offended. I was offended. Um, and I left there with only half of an application filled in. Back then, I don't know what the admissions process is now, but it's two parts. Um, I think there's a, you know, a, a standard portion and then there's an essay portion. Um, we left there, my mom called her boss, told her about our experience there. And um, now I remember, he was on the board at UVA, and he um, let him have it, from what I understand. Um, so much so that I was literally here, admitted to William & Mary, and committed as a student going for the first two to six weeks. I got letters from UVA saying you can still turn in the second half of your application. Of course, it was too late then. Um, the decision that I made to come here was based on that um, incident primarily, mm -hmm. but I also realized that being a, an African-American student at UVA at the time, and it may still be the case, that UVA was perfectly fine with having two separate universities. There were enough black students there that um, they could be amongst themselves mm -hmm. and feel like they were part of the school and they got their UVA degree and and everything was fine and then they were the majority would stick to themselves. Well coming here I couldn't do that. Um, coming here I would have to integrate into what was William and Mary whether William and Mary wanted me to or not uh, I would be forced to assimilate to the grand scheme of William and Mary. Um, now don't get me wrong we had while I was here, and I'm sure this will come up later in the interview, we had our own um, set things that would support each other. Um, one of the reasons for Hulon Willis, et cetera. Um, but for the most part, the, the notion of having a seven to 800 people UVA or a thousand black students at UVA that could be black UVA and white UVA um, versus, and having the same thing happen here were two different things. It just wasn't gonna happen. So that was part and partial of how I ended up here at William & Mary. The second positive factor though, as to why I ended up here was it reminded me of home. Um, I knew that I had to, it was small enough that I could focus. Um, I could go and be by myself. I could sit under a tree and study if I needed to, um, but yet big enough to allow me to feel that I was independent and away from home. So that was the positive aspect of how I ended up here. Right, wow, yeah, I can't even begin to imagine that experience at UVA, especially, especially being so convinced that's where you wanted to be and then having that experience. Oh, I didn't tell you what my friend had for Oh lunch. yeah, no you didn't. <laughs> he was upstairs and this, this drove it home. Uh, he was upstairs and he had uh, rice pilaf broiled fish and, you know, just shrimp. And it was That's... night and day as to what what was served for us for lunch. And we were there at the same time. And, of course, they ate upstairs. So 
he and I are really good friends today because we're on video. I won't say his name, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, still really good friends today. He owns a business in Richmond, and you know, it, we talk about that experience every now and then. He didn't even go to UVA after that. He went to JMU instead. Mm. But that was that was how I ended up here. Wow. Wow, yeah. Well, how did the admissions process here like compare to that, or what was the experience of that? Here? Well, I came down here, um, and I can't remember what stage um, and what at what point I met um, my mentor, um, Dean uh, Carol Hardy. Um, I can't remember if it was before the admissions process or after. I believe it was after. Some kind of way I came here, admissions went through the process, and I was accepted into the um, uh, VSTP program. It was an admissions program that Dean uh, Carol Hardy um, decided to start, mm -hmm. sort of a transition program for people that were accepted to the college, but on a conditional basis. And when I was in that program, I found out she also had another program that was for juniors uh, called STEP. Um, so VSTP and STEP were two programs that uh, Dr. Hardy had in place. And I came in through VSTP. It was a conditional basis. I had to have a certain average uh, over the summer. Um, it also was my first foray into college life. I will tell you, at the time, Essex High School didn't, even though we made good grades, there was nothing there to prepare you for college. So the transition was almost night and day. So I was very thankful for that program to get a, be able to get a taste of college before I got here. Um, and of course, obviously, uh, I did well in that program and was admitted um, the following um, semester to come right. full time. Um, and the good thing was it happened over the summer, so I didn't lose any time. I didn't lose mm -hmm. any option to go elsewhere if it didn't work out, those kinds of things. Gotcha. Right. And you mentioned this a little bit that when compared to UVA that had such a large African-American population there already, and you wouldn't have had that same like setup where it would be two different universities here. When mm -hmm. you first stepped on campus, whether that summer or um, that first semester, what was your impression of the amount of diversity on campus here? Well, I'll go through both. Okay. Um, during the summer, it was just us here. Mm -hmm. um, there may have been some students sprinkled in, um, taking other summer programs. So uh, VSTP and STEP, which was all minority students, basically had the run of campus for the summer. Um, so it was fun. Yeah. Um, the question of diversity at that point really didn't enter my mind. Uh, it wasn't until um, it wasn't until full admissions and everybody got here that you were able to, that you became fully aware of the the dichotomy between the majority and the minority here. Okay. Um, and what happened then uh, I still was very fortunate. Um, I was, uh, my admissions class, I think to this day, is still the most uh, admitted African American students here um, for that particular school year. We came in, I think there were 120 of us in the admitted class. I don't think, don't quote me, I don't think it's been that high since then. Um, and as a matter of fact, it dropped frighteningly low at one point. I think it got down to the 30s or 50s, you know, somewhere shortly after I graduated, uh, based on some incidences that had occurred on campus. Mm -hmm. That being said, um, it really didn't hit us until um, you saw the, I guess, the difference in the parties, the amenities and how they were set up for the majority students, the fraternity row, sorority row, uh, everything was laid out here for um, the majority, uh, which was the white student. 
Uh, but everything we did, we had to, I wouldn't say fight for. I, I mean, I don't want to take it, make my experience here comparable to that of the three trailblazers. It wasn't. Um, but everything that we did that was for us, we had to convince the university that it was necessary and that it was needed and why we needed it for us. Um, so, and they would listen, and, but they had, I think, part of that was they had no idea. They had no basis of knowledge. They had no reason to know, mm -hmm. um, which is why I was so thankful for people like Dr. Hardy and the, the minorities that were in, in admissions. And Dr. Hardy obviously was um, over minority affairs, mm -hmm. and I'll get into her uh, again later, but don't be surprised if I mention her throughout this interview because she was by far my the biggest influence on me while I was here. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for the most part, from 88 through 92, um, there was a commitment to diversity. Dean Sadler, um, who the Sadler Center was named after, was also one of those influences. And um, he listened to us. Uh, one of those things that was needed for us, uh, I found out as a member of Alpha Phi Alpha um, that um, my fraternity, uh, being here since 1975, used to have a fraternity house on campus. Um, we found out where it was. It was over there on Jamestown Road, um, just across from um, where Hardy Hall is now, uh, across the road. And I made it my mission to um, convince the school that we needed an on-campus house again. We had been here since 75. I think Delta Sigma Theta had a house on campus uh, in sorority row, um, but there was no fraternity housing to match. Um, and once again, to his credit, Dean Sadler listened to me, um, and he went to bat for us, and we ended up having a fraternity house for not only the rest of the years that I was here, but at least 10 more years after that, uh, across from the the new stadium area and the campus center, the Sadler okay. Center. Um, that, it was Lodge 16, was our alpha house. Um, and even when they tore down the houses where the Sadler Center currently sits, um, the alpha house still stood um, on that side of the street. And I think they just tore it down, even though we haven't been in there in a few years now. I don't think, it's, I don't think we've occupied that house um, for the last 10 years, possibly. But yeah. those were the types of things. I use that as an example where, you know, as a black student here, we had to convince the campus of the need for it when the white students had similar, but I don't think they had to convince. It was automatic. Right. It was automatic. Right. They had fraternity housing. And that's just an example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that makes sense, and that's actually really helpful to know because as I've just been doing research in preparation for these interviews, I've noted how many firsts, you know, like first homecoming queen who, of color, mm -hmm. first um, females of color on the soccer team. Like these were happening in the late 80s and 90s, and that's just, um, I guess for some it's not mind-blowing, and for others it is mind-blowing because yes. it's just so recent. Um, so, yeah, it is good. It is, it's helpful to know what the climate was during the late 80s and early 90s yes. here, for sure. Um, so there are a number, <laughs> numbers of directions I wanna branch off after what you just said. And I do wanna return at one point to hear about the incidents you were mentioning that maybe have led to a drop off in um, admissions because I, hadn't I haven't heard of that yet. So I would love to return back to that. Okay. But I'll first, make sure we do. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm putting that on you to remind me. But right. um, first I would like to talk just a little bit more about about your personal experience here, including um, maybe your very first experience, and I don't know if it was during that summer program or not, of coming onto William Mary's campus and what that looked like or felt like or smelled like, I don't know. Well, <laughs> the funny thing is, one of the greatest experiences that I had here, it's gonna sound really crazy and basic, but I think that's the country boy in me. When I was a student here, 
I don't think funding was an issue for state state schools. Okay. Um, I think budget was nice and high. And this place was a manicured heaven. It really was. Mm -hmm. um, Sunken Gardens was immaculate. Um, the sidewalks, the grass everywhere was cut and pristine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that really was attractive to me. It was very peaceful. And a, one thing I noticed over the years coming back as an alumnus, um, shortly after I graduated, I think the state started dealing with budget cuts and, and things like that. That was the first thing to go here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they're making efforts to make sure that that is up to par like it should be. But that was one of the, the aesthetics of the campus was one of the things that the that I noticed uh, and really fell in love with. Um, second to that, um, one of the first impacts on campus was Dean Hardy, again, her name, had a way of finding um, students that, and she met them where they were. Um, she, if she, noticed that you were a leader. She made sure you were in leadership, leadership roles. Mm -hmm. If she felt that you were um, struggling a little bit um, in coming into your own, um, not necessarily with student work, she made sure she found the people to increase your confidence. Mm -hmm. um, so, and she also never let you quit on yourself. One of the the biggest things coming into college here, and I don't know if it happens um, on colleges across the country, but I think it's uh, endemic here, is that when you come in, or back then when you came in, you had a certain level of confidence mm -hmm. because you had been successful in high school, you had been, but things would happen here to cause your confidence to wane um, very quickly. Um, the grades that you would get um, weren't what you were used to. Um, the the looks that you would get sometimes walking through walking through campus mm -hmm. or trying to fit in, et cetera, um, they were blows to your confidence. And Dean Hardy was there to make sure she checked the temperature of every African American student here. Mm -hmm. Uh, if they made themselves amenable to that. Um, and whenever you felt like you wanted to give up or you wanted to do something else, she found a way to step in and, and, and give you that extra push mm -hmm. so you could keep going. Um, so that was, that was one of the main overriding experiences that I had here the entire four years. Specifics um, back then, um, Dean Hardy was very, um, she was very in tune to bringing in um, people that were popular at the time, people that were making a name for themselves in the African American community. Um, and then she involved us in those roles. Um, I remember going to the airport to pick up. Giancarlo Esposito, who was, um, for the young people that don't know who he is, he was in, um, what was the name of the show? Uh, just was on, Eisenberg. Uh, yeah. I can't think of the name. Of the, <laughs> I can't think of the name of the show. It was very popular. Um, but anyway, uh, he was in that as the, as the evil character in that. Okay. And it, but he had also been in a lot of shows before then. Right. And for me, at 19 years old to drive to the airport to pick up yeah. a celebrity um, that I had watched on shows like A Different World and um, made guest appearances on uh, The Cosby Show and movies like Spike Lee's uh, Do the Right Thing. And I'm going to the airport to pick right. this person up to bring him back to campus and cater to him while he's here for us. Um, it just was an amazing experience. Same thing, Cicely Tyson, uh, I think Earl and I, Earl Granger and myself, were responsible for picking her up one day. Yeah. Um, so 
to have a um, minority administrator be in tune to bringing in the things that appealed to our culture and what we needed mm -hmm. uh, at the time was, was a gift that we, I don't think we really knew the gravity of while we were here, mm -hmm. but you know, obviously when you look back on it, you're like, those were the things that gave you the extra push mm -hmm. to, to um, do what you needed to do ha here academically. Um, the spiritual aspect that was here. Um, I was a member of Ebony Expressions um, and the BSO. And so, you know, we would go to practice once a week and then sing on Sundays and travel to mm -hmm. different churches. Um, you know, if a parent knew that their child was in Ebony Expression, it, it wouldn't be unusual for uh, their pastor to invite the entire choir to the church to sing for us. Obviously, they wanted to see the member that was in mm -hmm. the choir and bring them back. I, I think we went to my home church at one point. So we would travel on Sundays, and the Women Mary Green Machine bus would take us it would take us to these particular churches to sing on Sundays. And, you know, it was that kind of energy that would give you what you needed to get through the, uh, the next week or to get motivated for the exams that were coming up. Mm -hmm. So those were my experiences here. Um, you will circle back to some of the things that I think why the numbers went down mm -hmm. uh, in a moment. In addition to that fraternity life, obviously, um, I pledged Alpha Phi Alpha in my second semester, um, in my freshman year. Um, because of the amount of a African Americans here, we were able to have parties that would fill up mm -hmm. nice sized venues mm -hmm. and rooms. Um, so we had a good time, but I think it would get a little old because you see the same people all the time. Um, so that that was, we didn't have our own separate William and Murray. Mm -hmm. All of us had to assimilate, but when we wanted to get together amongst ourselves, we could. Sure. So that was the difference, I think, okay. um, between here and a school like UVA right. at the time. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, I'm kind of wondering how as a freshman, you find out about things like um, the BSO or Ebony Expressions and really begin to get ingrained in those. Was it um, through a point person like Carol Hardy or were, was, were they really well known enough to the point where you would go seek those out? Well, back then, I mean, today is social media. Yeah. Back then, uh, it was as simple as putting flyers up mm -hmm. on bulletin boards or stuffing um, mailers in the campus mailboxes. Mm -hmm. Uh, those were the things that we that we did to get the word out. Um, we would have interest me meetings for fraternities and sororities, mm -hmm. um, and you would see flyers go out for those. Or if a, if the Deltas were having a party, mm -hmm. they'd post a flyer, and um, everyone would know to show up to that because that's where all the black people were going to be <laughs> that on that particular evening or that weekend. Um, so Dean Hardy, uh, in addition to the flyers, uh, obviously she had certain people that would work for her. Mm -hmm. And once you were in BSTP at the time, uh, or STEP, yeah. or anything like that, and you came up through her, you were always connected to her. And you were sort of, she was brilliant now that I think about it. She, she groomed us and then she had her minions. Mm -hmm. So we became her, you know, we would spread the word for her. Right. Um, because, you know, that's what she wanted us to do. Mm -hmm. um, and she made sure we were fed. We, it, it just was a, it was a, in the midst of what could have been a bad uh, experience, it was a really good experience because of her. Yeah. And I think that's great, actually, that her name comes up so often because it's just a testament to the person she was and kind of just the, the figure she was on this campus and the yes. impact that she had. Um, yeah, my wife told me not to cry while I was no. talking about her, but I, I can't promise anything. Yeah. No, she sounds, I, I am very sad. I never had the opportunity yeah. to meet her because 
yeah, I just think that's great. And I do, I hear her name come up a lot in these yes. interviews and that's wonderful. And, and that of Sam Sadler as well, that yeah. he had such an impact. Um, so you had mentioned Carol Hardy and Sam Sadler. Um, were there other professors or mentors at William & Mary or even in the broader Williamsburg community that you recall during your time here? Well, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but my track here was government and a philosophy minor. And for whatever reason, it, it kept me away from one of the most dynamic professors that was here during the time. And I didn't know it. Um, and I had the good fortune of meeting her um, at the 25th anniversary, and that's Dr. Joanne Braxton. If there was some way I could come and take a class with her now based on what I've heard mm -hmm. and the, the people that she influenced that took her English classes, um, I would do it. Um, she, to have met her uh, and only sat with her for an hour, two hours during the gala and mm -hmm. talked with her um, was one of the best experiences that I've had. I mean, at the end of the gala, we embraced, or after she um, spoke uh, mm -hmm. and gave her her speech, we hugged and it was almost like I had been one of her students. Um, so that was one of the professors that I know was a great, inf an extreme influence over mm -hmm. there. Um, other black students here, uh, Professor Joanne Braxton, and I think she retires in 2018. Yeah. Um, so beyond that, though, um, there really wasn't any that stood out for me. Mm -hmm. um, there were obviously there were plenty of government professors that took interest in you, and you know it wasn't because they were African American. They mm -hmm. They bought into you succeeding, and I appreciated that. Um, but by far, Dr. Hardy and uh, Dean Sadler were the two biggest influences mm. here. Um, Dean Sadler, um, he just seemed to be a natural. Now that I'm older, I realize what it, what it was a natural politician. He mm. knew how to take. Um, what we wanted and figure out how to make it fit into the grand scheme of things without, I guess, upsetting the apple cart, mm. so to speak, here with the powers that be. Yeah. Uh, he knew that balance. And I think, I think how it worked was Dean Hardy reported to him mm. and she was he was responsible or in a great part responsible for bringing her on board. Uh, so we all benefited from both of them. We benefited from him and having the good sense to, to bring on Dr. Hardy. And obviously we benefited from her because um, she was interested in our transition here. Mm -hmm. so. Right. And I keep meaning to ask him these, and I think it's important to ask if, um, the African-American community on William and Mary's campus, or at least in your experience, had any interaction with the African-American community in the broader Williamsburg area? Uh, yes, um, we did. And I think it varied for, for many. Um, a lot of the, um, the good part about the African-American experience, or we call a divine nine, with regard to our sororities and fraternities is community service. Okay, and that community service is not just us and hosting tailgates and stuff like that. A big part of that is going out into the community that you are part of, uh, and it's ingrained um, very early on um, that service aspect. So we would have, and because I'm not here now, I don't remember specifically a lot of the programs, but um, we would have. Um, programs with students from the schools. Um, we were involved in at least um, three or four different churches around here that we would go to. Um, 
something as small as the African American experience with regard to a barber shop. Yeah. Um, we had the two. There were two barber shops. One Tony Stocker that everyone went to, uh, and the experience of going to the barber shop and interacting with the locals that went to that barber shop uh, and how they made you feel comfortable coming in as a student even though they didn't know you and sure. you ended up developing relationships. I will um, regret to this day if I don't go back and mention another African American influence sure. that was here. There was a cafeteria worker okay. um, here and I'm sure someone watching this video will be able to name her just like but every black student that went to school here knows her mm -hmm. she looked out for us and treated us like she, we were her own um, when we would come back to campus 10 years later and see her she knew our names oh, and um, you know I I'm a tear up thinking about the fact that I cannot remember her name right now, but you would see her and she would call you by name. Wow. And this is after graduating 10 years. Um, and to think the number of African-American students that have come through mm -hmm. and know this woman and her for her to remember your name yeah. is a pretty big deal. Yeah, that's it's a pretty huge. big deal. Um, it was people like that, people that drove the buses that made sure you, you got home mm -hmm. safely uh, and looked out for you and waited that little extra moment to make sure you disappeared into the building that you were supposed to go right. into. Um, it, was, it was a sense of community in the sense that they knew They knew the history that you were making mm. by being here. And um, I guess they wanted to make sure you succeeded. Yeah. So, you know, that, yeah. that was a pretty big deal. All right, let me get myself together. Yeah, uh, that absolutely would be to have that sort of support system here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so those are the things that I remember mm -hmm. when I when I focus on you know uh, my time here, mm -hmm. and you know when you think about it in the grand scheme of things, you don't you don't necessarily I guess think about it every day, but I guess when you're sitting for an interview and you're thinking about your experiences, that they come up. Yeah, they come up. Well, we'll so, figure out her name and we'll add it into the notes for the interview. I, I would appreciate it. We will absolutely sure do that. Too. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's great. And I actually, and this is a side note, I can talk more about this after the interview, but I would love to interview members of the staff who have worked here a long time because they're part of their experience is part of this whole experience in this campus as well. Yeah. And I think it's important to do so. So any names in the future that you think of, um, I would love to reach out to those individuals as well. But for now, we are focused on you, of course. You mentioned this earlier, I didn't want to lose it entirely. You studied government mm -hmm. and philosophy minor, you said. Why did you choose that? At the time, um, when I chose government, you know, really, I think half of it was I was scared of all the other courses. <laughs> I, I, did, I did not have a math brain. I just didn't. Um, it, didn't work that way um, so I had to figure out something to do to get the degree here and then it came to a point where all right well if I get a degree in government what am I gonna do with that am I gonna be a page am I gonna go and work with Congress what just what am I gonna do with it and had a little bit of experience with that through internships and determined that that wasn't the way I wanted to go and then it dawned on me that I needed to actually um, dig in mm -hmm. so to speak and try to turn whatever grades or experience I had um, in the, as a government major into a law school admission mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, basically I think it was chosen by default um, I always had I always had an interest in 
how government worked. Um, I was very argumentative all the time. Um, always have been. Uh, I think I was put out of um, classes multiple times in high school because I disagreed with the teacher and we would argue and mm -hmm. instead of being a bigger person and and debating with me, they would get frustrated and ask me to leave. <laughs> so, I think I've always naturally been a person that, you know, would engage and debate mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. So that's how I ended up in law school, and that's probably how I ultimately ended up being a government major. Sure. Were there any venues here on campus or arenas within which you could have kind of those debates or debates about important issues of the day while you were here? any club that we ran <laughs> because there was no shortage of opinions um, you know fraternities um, BSO um, but as far as academically I'm sure that there were um, to be honest with you um, with the extracurriculars that we were involved in for the most part um, getting involved in like a debate team or something like that um, would have probably added too much to the plate. Now, if we found those things first, mm -hmm. you know, we probably would have gravitated toward them. But the things that we found first were more geared toward um, enhancing our experiences as black students here. Right. And those were the things we tended to gravitate, gravitate to. Yeah. Well, it sounds like in within those organizations you had um, – plenty of opportunity to have yeah. those discussions and debates, so that's great. Mm -hmm. um, so you've talked about some of these, but I wonder if there are any moments or events or experiences in particular that stand out as your very favorite, like a very favorite memory you have of your time here. Okay, there are multiple. Yeah, you can um, tell all of them. <laughs> let's see. One was uh, a step show. Um, <laughs> there are two step shows. <laughs> Before the Sadler Center was built, we used to have step shows in various places throughout campus. And one was the old campus center, which is across Jamestown Road. Um, and we did this huge, my fraternity had been, um, there had been only one or two members that would pledge or go through the process prior to my line, which was three people. Mm -hmm. There were three of us. so. It was sort of like a rebirth uh, of the fraternity. We were infused with new members and coming back. And we decided to do a step show. There was um, a song out by a group called Soul to Soul okay. uh, at the time. And the song was Back to Life. And um, for some reason, I guess they figured that I would probably eventually end up being the president. Mm -hmm. of the, so they, they wanted to make me the feature. So... We made this coffin, and we did this Egyptian-themed um, um, entrance to the step show where I was in the coffin and four fraternity brothers wearing sphinx heads brought me out, set me on stage, and in front of them were people carrying tiki torches. Um, to, and then, of course, the music would start, and I burst out of the coffin and did a step, and it was back to life, that kind of thing. Extremely fun, extremely, you know, crowd went wild, those kinds of things. Well, one of the things we didn't think about uh, in this brilliant idea of the tiki torches is that the buildings have fire alarms. So we're walking down the hall at the beginning of the step show with the tiki torches burning, and all of a sudden the fire alarm goes off. So we have to basically reset Stop the step show, stop everything, deal with the fire department. Go ahead and laugh, you can. <laughs> deal with the fire department, convince them that we weren't really trying to burn the building down um, so that they would let us have our step show and we would finish. Um, wow. That, that was one experience. And the other one um, with regard to a step show, and I'll give, give some, some more soon, but with regard to a step show is that um, – and this was after I graduated, actually. I think it was a year or so after I graduated. But we, we were on a tear as far as the fraternity was concerned with bringing in new members and infusion of, mm -hmm. of, 
uh, of, of people that were interested. And right before I graduated, my line brother, um, who is deceased now, Chris, uh, Chris Baker, uh, ended up going to Egypt uh, and learning Arabic over the summer. Now, when I say learn Arabic over the summer, I mean fluent. And so much so that he ended up, before graduating here, I think he was fluent in seven languages. And it just was a natural for him. Um, but anyway, he, he came back and he infused all of this multi multicultural influence into the way we did things um, with the fraternity, hookah pipes, just different things. Yeah. And the next thing you know, we had this sweetheart court. And our sweetheart court was the most multiple, uh, multicultural thing you would ever want to see. We had Hispanics, we had Arabics, we had <laughs> black, black girls. I mean, just, it, was, it, was, it was absolutely amazing. So anyway, that, would, that atmosphere, I believe, generated um, a bigger interest in my fraternity. Mm -hmm. Um, and we went from that to when I graduated, having a good number of guys on campus in that alpha house that I told you about. I think at one point there were 16 to 18 alphas, 20 alphas on campus. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they had the step show. Uh, and the step show um, featured a tribe called Quest. They came in. Dean Hardy agreed to bring in a tribe called Quest to Wimmerbury Hall. And a lot of us came back, and this was probably the first year after I graduated, and they come back and see that we're now stepping in Wimmerbury Hall. Um, and the guy's interest entrance for that particular step show involved driving an actual limo or car into Wimmerbury Hall and getting out and getting on stage after Tribe Call Quest performed, it was unbelievable. It didn't, no one could tell you that you went, that this was William and Murray. These were the kinds of experiences that we had here. And I don't think it can be repeated, it has been repeated since. Uh, I listened to some of the other alumni that are older than us, and I think their comparable experience was, and it. I wish I was here. They were able to bring earth, wind, and fire here. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so those type of experiences really stand out, even though that last step show that I just described was after I left. Sure. Um, but to bring people like Giancarlo Esposito, Cicely Tyson, um, they, they those experiences are unmatched mm -hmm. in, in, in my opinion. And they were some of the best here. They really were. Yeah. Um, wow, do we have these step shows on video, I wonder? Well, you know, I have gone and attempted to track down these and every time I try to get, get them or think I'm getting close, um, they, uh, the, the effort fizzles out, yeah. but I think Beth uh, Young, Elizabeth Young, has some on video. I know Dean Carroll Hardy had several. I don't know where these videos are, but I am just as curious to find them. I know they were taped. They were VHS. Yeah. We were not that old. They were VHS taped when we were um, coming along. Uh, maybe not the, the Back to Life one that I told you about uh, with the smoke detector. That's what I'm wanting to see, <laughs> if I'm honest. That's the one. <laughs> but... uh. But I, they're on somebody's tapes okay. somewhere. So we need to find we, them. We need to find them. Yeah, we need to find we'll make them. that a personal goal because I would love to <laughs> see those. It would be great to have in our collection. But that first one, man, <laughs> the, the fire funny. alarm one. Yeah, yeah. That was, funny. <laughs> I was trying not to laugh on tape, but it's on there. <laughs> um, so shifting gears a little bit from favorite memories or funniest memories and experiences, I'm wondering... If there are any difficult memories that stick out in your mind from your time here that you can point to? This is going to sound crazy in, in light of everything that um, many of the experiences that different people have had here. 
for me personally, I would have to say the hardest thing here for me was getting adjusted to the academic rigor. Okay. It wasn't the, for me, it wasn't the social atmosphere or anything like that. I had a good time at Weary Murray. Um, and I guess that's what I struggle with most now. Mm. As president of Ulan Willis Association, I know a whole lot of people didn't. And I didn't have a good time because I forgot who I was. I mean, I assimilated with with blacks, whites, all. But I had a good time. I don't know whether it was my attitude or whether it was because there were so many of us or whether I was I had an easy time making friends. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But... The hardest part for me here was the academic side and staying and feeling like I was constantly beat up, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, academically. I mean, obviously I came out okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to struggle to get that B was, you know, I mean, A's were unheard of. <laughs> but to struggle to get, get that B and to have a decent B average going into, you know, mm -hmm. graduate school for me was the was the hardest thing here for me. Negative experience, if I had to pinpoint it, it was it would be the effort in getting something done. And that would be the the aspect of convincing mm -hmm. Dean Sadler or, or or someone that we would need that we need right. this and why we need it. Eventually it would um, it would happen. Um, but that would be the, the biggest negative experience. Um, I al also say that my class seemed to be the class that, um, that would make the most noise about something. Okay. And then the class behind us would benefit from our noise. Mm -hmm. Um, and to give a perfect example of that, um, back in, before 92, William Murray's Law School, mm -hmm. for instance, um, would have, was in the habit of basically swapping students between here and UVA. So if you went to UVA, mm -hmm. you, it was almost automatic that you got into law school here. Gotcha. And if you went here undergrad, it was almost automatic that you got into law school at uh, UVA. Um, I don't pay, I think people realize this, but the, the lack of knowledge that you have at 20, 21 years mm -hmm. old um, compared to what you have after you've lived a little bit uh, is night and day. So to add to and, and continue with my experience at the beginning of this interview, um, I didn't know at the time the difference between $8,000 and $13,000. It all seemed like money to me. So when I was applying to law school, I applied to University of Maryland, Pepperdine, uh, William and Murray, and Wake Forest. I didn't even apply to UVA. Probably would have been instantaneously admitted to UVA. At least that's my, especially based on my history. I was still mad at UVA, so I didn't want to have anything to do with them. Sure. But I also didn't realize how good of a law school education it would have been and how cheap it would have been compared to what I paid for Wake Forest. Mm -hmm. Fast forward a little bit. Um, I started this part of the conversation by saying that my class was the class that made noise and the next class would benefit from it. So um, I applied to William & Mary for law school. They put me on the wait list. Um, I was devastated. Dean Hardy was not devastated. She was pissed. <laughs> she was upset. So much so, um, basically, I think she made it her personal mission to address the dean of the law school and whoever would listen to her to highlight uh, my experience here and try to let them know that 
she thought that this was a place that not only looked at academics, but how a person's leadership and the things that they did while they were here also transitioned into what kind of, kind of person they were, what kind of person they would be. Uh, I think I graduated with a 2.9, yeah, it was just below a 3, 2.9 here. And I don't mind saying this now because it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Back then, I probably would have been embarrassed by it. Um, and I was waitlisted here, but I also was the president of this, the leader of that, you know, yeah. and, and involved in everything on campus. And, well, lots of things on campus. I can't say everything. And that should have counted for something. Mm -hmm. Just like with UVA, I was at Wake Forest. The day I met my law school roommate, the day I met him, we were out on campus, you know, getting our admission stuff and getting ready to go. I get a call from Wim and Murray, hand of God. You're off the wait list. You can come to school here. Now, you know, in retrospect, I probably should have said, yeah, but I was angry. Yeah. Now, I was angry at Wim and Murray because I was waitlisted and you know I had given my in my opinion my heart soul everything to this this college and I was waitlisted at the for law school where I wanted and I was going to be here three more years intended to be here three more years that next year the largest African-American class of law school admittance in William Murray's law school history to that point of its own students that went to school here, the largest. And I know it's because Dean Hardy sure. went to bat for me right. and probably some of the other uh, African-American students that may have been waitlisted or didn't get in. Uh, at Wake Forest, I ended up down there with, I know that there were at least four other students ahead of me that had gone to Wake and had established a reputation. So Wake was becoming a pipeline for um, for students that had gone to school here. Stanley Osborne, um, Rita Sampson, um, Holly Guest. Um, those were three that I can think of that had gone to, um, to Wake Forest mm -hmm. after having graduated here um, that were in roads for, for me to go down there. So yeah. inadvertently, uh, the community stayed strong and looked out for each other, but that would be my negative mm -hmm. uh, yeah. for here. Yeah, absolutely. To have already had kind of a complicated situation when you plan to go somewhere for undergraduate and have that happen, and then to have that happen at the place that you had grown to like become ingrained in over four years, I just... Yeah, I can definitely see how there would be some anger associated with that. <laughs> yes. Um, so, gosh, that makes me want to ask questions. I do have questions here about your trajectory after, and I do want to talk about some of that. Um, I have, like, one more question about your time as a student here okay. before we jump into that, if that's fine with you. So, this is something I try to research when I'm preparing for these interviews, how sociopolitical events worldwide or nationwide or statewide unfolded on William and Mary's campus or if they did at all. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to think of different things that happened during the time you were here nationally or beyond um, the Rodney King riots mm -hmm. happened. Um, I mean, a, a bunch of things really in those first, those early 90s. Do you remember any sort of activism or reaction to nationwide or worldwide events on campus, whether you were a part of them or not? No, um, the the biggest thing that happened here, and just because of the amount of time that's passed, um, I'm not exactly sure as to the time frame, sure. but I believe it was my senior year. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how closely related this was to Rodney King. I don't think it was. I think it just was um, someone with regard to the flat hat decided to um, take their cartoon to mm -hmm. another level. Um, and there was a cartoon character called Mighty Whitey. Um, and Mighty Whitey had, um, it was a play on William and Murray, the, M, the W and the M. And um, Mighty Whitey would, 
come out with, I think, two or three comic strips ran um, in the flat hat. Um, and there was a big upheaval and protest about the things that were coming out of that comic strip, the fact that the flat hat was printing them. Obviously, um, you know, we know um, freedom of speech, et cetera. Um, but there's a certain type of speech. Um, and we consider that hate speech, which is not free speech. Um, so that was a big upheaval um, while I was here. And I think that was my senior year. And I am 100% certain that those articles and the fallout from those articles uh, uh, were the primary reasons that the next four to six years, the admissions uh, population for mm -hmm. African American students here dropped to a critical level. Right. Um, of course, for me in law school, it was the O.J. Simpson verdict that that happened while I was in law school. Right. But I was already gone from from here mm -hmm. um, when that came out. But here it was the flat hat and the mighty whitey articles that were a big deal. Yeah. Um, when when I was here. And I'm sure um, in your position, you probably can find some of them if you haven't already. <laughs> yeah. uh, but those those were the, the the things that people would feel emboldened enough to to do those kinds of things yeah. uh, and, and make cartoons of us. Um, obviously, the biggest the fraternity that we had the most trouble with here. Uh, and that still, I scratch my head today, was K.A. Um, they would do uh, a march on campus. Um, and for the light, there was an African-American student that was in my class, I believe, but he didn't associate with any of us, mm -hmm. um, that was in K.A., um, and this fool, and I don't have any hesitation of calling him a fool, was at the forefront like he was the Grand Marshal of their freaking Confederate parade. Um, and so those were the kinds of ignorant things that happened, you mm -hmm. know, while I was here. Um, so I kind of take back a little bit. It wasn't all glory <laughs> and, and good times for me when I was here. But I guess I was able to push that stuff back and repress it. But those those were some of the things that right. that, and I don't know if K still has that parade. I don't know, um, but I know it went on, and I know it's a K A tradition. Um, but to see an African American student um, mm -hmm. be in the midst of all of that and almost be oblivious. To, well, he would have to be oblivious to <laughs> to what they were doing or be brainwashed um, that that was somehow that they were somehow celebrating a good thing was was uh, very disturbing. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I believe those marches have ceased to exist, but you're right; they continued for an incredibly long time. Right. What was the reaction to this, or do you recall? I mean, they continued to do it year after year, so I don't know necessarily that any reaction stopped them or made them pause, but... Well, there were so few of us here that they yeah. didn't give a darn. I mean, you know, so, you know, we would we would do our um, little protest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there could be 10 to 25 of us that would kind of jump in front of them and meet them in the street, but it, it never amounted to violence or anything like that. Um, but it really didn't make a difference i don't even think it made news that it was that that we were it was just like a regular day on campus which was you know for something like that to go on and be like another day in the day of days is yeah. is pretty incredible in my opinion yeah absolutely well thank you for kind of going back and thinking about that um I think it does speak to your experience that the, those positive things, the community that you had here and the, the good memories you have stand out most to you. I think that's, you know, speaks a lot about your experience here, but yeah, it's good for us to know the kind of yes. things that went on for sure. Um, so to 
now jump into your trajectory post William and Mary. I now know how you ended up at Wake Forest and how that ended up being, and you said there were others there from William and Mary that kind of, mm -hmm. um, well, were just, you know, familiar faces there right. maybe. So how do you feel or do you feel that William and Mary prepared you for that trajectory following your time here? Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, the, the answer to that 110% is yes. I wasn't prepared for William and Mary coming out of high school but I certainly was prepared for law school coming out of William & Mary. Yeah. Um, there was nothing here um, close to what one would call great inflation. Um, and academically, I, I felt that that applied across the board to everybody, um, no matter who you were, white, black, whatever. It just, either you, you got it or you didn't, and they were there for you um, to help you through it, but there was no special treatment here. And I think the college enjoyed that reputation, and I'm glad that they did because, you know, as an adult, you see what that means compared to, you know, other schools that, you know, everybody gets an A just for showing up. If you didn't come to class here, you got an F. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, there was no showing up and, Professor, what can I do? Um, I need to get out of this class or my mom is going to disown me. It, it was none of that. Um, you could come to class here, work your hardest, and still get a C. Uh, and it was, it was baffling at times and frustrating. Um, but when you look back over it, what they were looking for and what they ultimately got out of you prepared you for the next level. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate. Um, and I know this is a William Murray interview, but I was fortunate to have uh, a person similar. She was, she was a white uh, admissions uh, dean, uh, but similar to Dean Hardy uh, at Wake Forest. Her name was Melanie Nutt. I'll never forget her. Uh, and you, you may, if you were to interview Rita, if you were to interview Holly, if you were to interview Stan, they would say the same name. Um, where she had the knack of looking out for um, you coming from William and Mary. And to this day, I think if I ran into her, um, if she's still alive, I would hope she is. It, I, if I ran into her, she would know my name. And she had a special knack for knowing mm -hmm. every student that came in from from her. And I think people like those, especially when it comes to academia, are um, are very special people. Yeah. So. Yeah, they definitely make you feel value, valued, I yeah. guess, definitely remembering you, especially after having so many students cross their path. Yes. That's great. Were there any other things or aspects of your time here that you took with you into your eventual law profession? Probably the, the biggest thing that I took with me from here mm -hmm. would have come had I been wherever Dean Hardy was mm -hmm. and I hate to go back to her again oh, but she she taught me to persevere mm -hmm. she taught me to be a leader she taught me to be confident in myself when I wasn't sure so all of those things that came from her that my parents didn't know how to do mm -hmm. not that they didn't want to do but they didn't know how to do I mean you, you got to understand I'm the I have no one in front of me that has gone to college um, to say, hey, do it this way. Watch out for this pitfall. Watch out for that pitfall. Um, you know, I think students, you know, which is why I always, uh, I'm going to digress a little bit. There is a school of thought that thinks that the playing field is, is even just because you open the gates and you let everybody start. And I, don't, I just don't understand for the life of me how that can be when there are generations upon generations upon generations of white students that have had college educations. Uh, they've had their parents, the benefit of their grandparents, their great parents, grandparents having college educations. And we're just as African Americans getting to the point where we're having two, three generations of students that have gone to college. Um, for me, I was the first. 
I was obviously here with some people whose parents were uh, academics and had gone to college. Mm -hmm. Uh, and for the most part, their profession was probably uh, a teacher, a lawyer, or a doctor. Um, were the professions, and this, my classmates were second generations in that in that group. But there were just as many here who were first mm -hmm. first time uh, students. Um, I forgot the question. I knew where I was going with that. But um, the, my point was there. The, the playing field is is not even, mm -hmm. um, and I understand the theory behind it should be even. But if you're running a 300 meter race and somebody has 200 meters out in front on of you, and you start when they come back around and you start in the same place, they're gonna they're gonna cross the finish line first, and you know that is where we have to get in my opinion, as a, as a nation, to understanding that all we want as African-American students and as African-American people is a shot to be. Uh, we want the same things that everyone else wants. We, we love our families. We love, you know, we, we want each other to succeed. And given that shot, given that opportunity, um, we can excel at it just as well as anybody else. Um, that experience was emphasized here through the confidence that was given to me um, in completing this education here. Uh, and now I get to whether my kids go to school here or not, I get to instill that same confidence in them because I went through it. Yeah, absolutely. That was so well said. Um, and you did answer the question, <laughs> so no, that's great. Um, so I know the answer to this question, but I want to get it on tape. Are you still involved with William and Mary, and in what ways? Um, yes, obviously you knew the answer to that. Um, I am the current president of the Hulon Willis Association. Um, Hulon Willis um, was, Hulon Willis Sr., I think it was Sr., was the uh, first African American student to get a degree um, from, from this campus. Not the first student to have residence here. We know we're here celebrating the 50th for three wonderful women that were brave enough to um, to don the halls of the campus as resident students. But we celebrated our 25th anniversary as a uh, alumni, as an alumni affinity group um, this June, past June. And I've been president now for two years. And one of the things that I wanted uh, as president uh, to see the club do is have us in a position where we're transitioning to the next 25, 50 years, and that the African American student here now knows that HWA is their affinity group. Um, the hardest part about what I've been involved in with HWA is actually making um, that connection with the undergraduate group. We're working on it. Uh, we're first getting, the first step was getting our house in order and celebrating us and what we have. And I think that went across mm -hmm. and came across very well with our 25th. Now it's time to transition and show, all right, look at us and look at what you have to step into, what yeah. legacy's been made for you. Um, so that's one of my connections to campus. Earl Granger, I have the fortune um, of being a classmate of his um, so he has no qualms or hesitancy about Thomas you need to give some money so <laughs> uh, reaching back that's his job and uh, I appreciate him and applaud him for it so the connection that I have with him and other people that are here that have some experience with uh, Dean Hardy and decided to come back and work here 
is, is pretty amazing. So I'm involved with him and uh, Sean Glover. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't intend to be president much longer um, of HWA, but I intend to continue to be engaged in the college. Great. Um, I have a couple of questions about the Helan Wells Association, given that we just celebrated the 25 years and I was at that event and it was incredible in DC this summer. Um, but it started that year you graduated. Do you, were you involved at that point or did you know that this was being um, formalized? When, or yeah. I knew that it was being formalized, mm -hmm. but I wasn't involved. Um, that credit goes to a, um, an ad hoc committee or spearheading committee that Dean Hardy had the vision to set up. Mm -hmm. um, she realized that she had put in, into place a, a outlets for us as students here on campus and that she was looking out for us here on campus, but she also realized that we would graduate. And what was there for us to maintain that same connection um, when we when we graduated, and and have an affinity toward the college, so she and Julian Julian Bond, I believe, and a couple other people um, decided that we needed an African American affinity group. They formed a committee, um, and I cannot I don't want to misquote or or leave names out, but Elizabeth Young was one of them. Uh, and several others got together. They came up with the name um, and the mission mm -hmm. uh, and presented it back to Dean Hardy to give her what she needed to present it to the board. Uh, and that's how it was born. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a vision of hers. She set a committee in place to look for um, what she wanted and that's, that's how we were born. That's great. Um, can you speak a little bit about the, I mean, I think it's obvious what the significance is, but could you speak a little bit about the significance and the impact of this organization's existence over the past 25 years? Well, um, the biggest um, impact, in my opinion, is twofold. Mm -hmm. um, the scholarships that they've been able to give, that we have been able to give to deserving African-American students. Um, but not only that, the, the camaraderie um, that we have uh, and we're able to bring back when, when, when it's time to come back to campus and it's time to um, gather again, mm -hmm. it's time we're able to do it through HWA. Um, we're able to do it through an alumni group that's our own um, that we share the same interests. We're able to talk about our experiences here, which are very common, mm -hmm. uh, and we're able to bond over those things. So it is, it is almost like a mini reunion amongst reunions mm -hmm. when, when we come back to campus. Um, that has probably been one of the biggest impacts of HWA, uh, is the, the sense of camaraderie and the, and the fact that we have, as African Americans, a shared experience. Um, having graduated from the College of William & Mary. Sure. And I think it, I believe it was during a conversation with Earl that he had mentioned that um, similar to anything else, this organization had ebbed and flowed with the years as well. And there were a couple of years where it, um, it was definitely more difficult to get some involvement. But then when you compare it to the summer when it, there was such a huge turnout in D.C. and yes. just so much excitement surrounding it. Um, and do you remember anything that caused that, or was it really just those natural processes of? Well, the real reason behind it is um, I felt as president that it was with the 25th coming up um, and the things that I had seen that we had done mm -hmm. that we could use that particular timing as a springboard to show that we, as an organization, can do more, okay? I had, even though I had been coming back as, you know, a member of HWA, 
before that time, one of the things that we we would always do, we would we would put on events, and and some of them would be grand, and some of them would have something missing, and mm-hmm. some of them would. So one of the visions that I laid out for a committee of people that were involved in the planning of the event was that I wanted it to be top notch. And we were always concerned about cost. Is it, mm-hmm. Does it cost too much to do this? And people don't come out because they don't like to spend money. I think one of my biggest accomplishments was convincing them that we're adults. Mm-hmm. Obviously, everything has a value, and if we value HWA, we will spend for that value. Mm. Um, we spend for the value of everything else that we want. And I think it was that mindset that transitioned into every committee, uh, into the alumni support that we got from the, the college, the support that we got from the 50th mm. um, uh, committee, mm. all of that translated and built into the gala um, in the in the weekend the celebration of the 25th um, because we had gotten to the point where we had transitioned from being afraid that people weren't going to come out because um, they didn't want to spend X Y and Z to a point where if you give them something of value they'll spend the money and celebrate it um, and to me, that was the, the biggest transition that I wanted to create for HWA. And I hope, I hope that we're able to maintain that, mm-hmm. um, that we step up our level of what we do for each other. And because we've shown that we can do it on a grand scale, that we'll continue to do it that way. Yeah. So. Great. Great. So I have a couple of broad questions before I actually turn it over to you to add anything that you want to. I'm wondering if you have, or no, I'm wondering what changes you have seen at William Mary over time and what you think of them. Well, obviously I like the, the changes that I've seen that I like the most are its growth. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, um, the, the fact that the school has grown um, both um, in its vision um, with how it accommodates its students and what it provides its students uh, makes me proud to have been an alumni of the school. Um, it's continuing to grow, it's continuing to remodel, um, and it's continuing to be ahead of the needs of the students. So that I'm extremely proud of. Um, was that a two-part question? I think. <laughs> well, just yeah. I'm getting ready to go into the negatives. <laughs> oh no, no, that's fine too. That's yeah. There's space for that too. Okay. Uh, just what you think about the changes. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Mm-hmm. What I'm most disappointed about mm-hmm. is that the school has not yet found a way to attract African American faculty and to create a, um, an environment that African-American faculty want to come here and thrive here. Um, and it's a problem that needs to be solved. And I don't know what else can be done uh, about that yet, but I think the college's recognition of the importance of African-American students and our contribution to the college and everything that they've put into the 50th is a good sign toward that. I applaud the school for that and I hope that that leads or at least is the beginning of um, their commitment to trying to figure out the problem when it comes to um, African-American faculty. wanting to be here on campus and making it an environment that they want to thrive. And I think if they do that, if we do that as a college, then we will see an increase in minority students. That won't be a superficial increase. Uh, It'll be one that 
is a lasting one that people can want to come here and get an education because they've heard about this professor or they know this particular person is here and they wrote this book and they're responsible for this this movement um, that is the kind of college I think that we need to somehow turn into and I don't know what has been the hold up mm -hmm. when it comes to that um, so as I as I transition from my role in HWA, um, those are the areas that I hope to try to move into mm -hmm. in trying to help. I don't have solutions, I, I don't, but to whatever extent um, that I can offer a voice and help that process, I hope to be able to do that. Yeah, definitely. And are there any other changes you hope to see here in addition to those obvious and just um, heavy efforts to attract faculty of color? No, I'd like to see us not schedule JMU for a football game at homecoming <laughs> ever again, yep. uh, especially after they won the division. Um, but that's, that, that's obviously... <laughs> that's uh, a real wish. You know, <laughs> we have a special thing here at William & Mary, and um, some kind of way we have to figure out how to make this old campus attractive to a varying degree of people. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily know the answer to that, um, but, but the effort needs to be put in, the, in that category, I think. I really do. So just one more question before I turn it over. Um, we are in the midst of the celebration for 50 years of African Americans in residence mm -hmm. on campus. And we've touched on this a little bit throughout the interview, but um, I'm wondering if you would mind articulating what you believe to be the value of diversity and inclusion on campus and in the world. That's a broad question. That's one of those ones that could keep us here a long time, but I'll try to be short. Okay. Um, the value um, here on campus should be evidence based on the value of diversity in the world. Um, we have, there, there's evidence out there wherever you look that everyone's experience culturally benefits from having the mindset that you are inclusive to other cultures, to other ways of thoughts, mm -hmm. um, and to other ways of doing things. We are a liberal arts school. As a liberal arts school, the last thing we should be struggling with is diversity. But for some reason, it seems to be one of the main things we, just, we struggle with. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest hurdle, in my opinion, to diversity is having a closed mind. Um, if you are already set in a certain way, that could be okay. But if you're set in that way and you're not willing to listen to other, to other points of view, um, you might as well have a parachute that doesn't open. Um, so in any successful business, in any successful uh, socioeconomic experiment, in any successful movement, all have been the end result taking different frames of thought, different ways of doing things, uh, and different ways to excel. Um, and we as a college together need to figure out a way um, to mix that all in and make it, 
make it part of our soul, our fiber, our well-being. Um, it seems that we have gotten there as a college for the most part when it comes to diversity of, um, of sexual orientation. But we haven't gotten there when it comes to diversity of thought um, for ethnic orientation. Um, VCU um, is light years ahead of, of us when it comes to um, the contributions of minority students from all walks of life. There's no reason that we shouldn't be at least modeling ourselves after academic institutions like that. Um, and part of the reason that we may be struggling in that aspect is because VCU is so close and they end up attracting people that would normally come here. I don't know. But for us to truly transition into what I feel would be uh, the college of the future as far as women and women is concerned, we have to embrace diversity and multiculturalism. We have to embrace it. Thank so. you for answering that. And now I want to ask you if there's anything that I haven't asked that you thought I would, and this is also an opportunity for you to add anything and everything you want to. Um, I think for the most part, the questions, um, whether I w went off track or not, allowed me to get out all of my thoughts. Yeah. Um, I would like to say that um, thank you for the opportunity to allow me to, to sit down and present my oral history. Um, I don't know that I am anyone that's important enough to justify this type of <laughs> this type of uh, documentation, but my experience here at William & Murray is such that I think um, the African American student that thinks that maybe they're alone mm -hmm. and that they, that someone else doesn't understand what they're going through may benefit from this. Um, the student that thinks that, um, that doesn't necessarily believe um, how hard it was um, for students here may benefit from this. Mm -hmm. um, and the students that had no idea of what it was like because they've, their experience here is completely different and has nothing to do or is anywhere closely related to our experiences mm -hmm here can look back at this and say, wow, just in 1988, this is what it was like here at this mm -hmm. co college. And that wasn't that far, that long ago. I know I'm old, but I'm not that old. So for those reasons, um, i just just wrap up by saying I appreciate the opportunity for being here. I appreciate um, the fact that the college has the vision to realize that this is important mm -hmm. and that um, they have hired people like you to put this on tape and memorialize it. Yeah, absolutely, and I want to thank you for participating. I can't tell you, I think every single person I ever interview says they don't know what, <laughs> they're not sure if they should be, you know, on, on film or that their story isn't, I don't know, they're not sure why it's being captured, but for all those reasons you listed and more, um, this has been inspiring and so informative, and just thank you for participating. You're welcome. My pleasure.